Good morning, Park Avenue Bible Church. We're excited that you're here again with us to worship. Why don't you stand in your house churches or wherever you are and join us in singing. from Lamentations 3, 22 to 25. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. i 
this next song is a fairly new song that we introduced a couple weeks ago. Um, it's full of declaration of who God is and what he has done for us. It talks about God's, God bringing us joy and his righteousness, his freedom, his eternal peace, and, his, and him being the only source of hope for us. When we fix our eyes on him and allow him to save us and change our hearts, he also gives us his Holy Spirit. In Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And we have seen this also in Acts, as we've studied Acts the last number of weeks, where it talks about the Holy Spirit coming to the church and indwelling among them. In Acts 2.4, it says, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. This isn't because of anything we have done, but by the grace of God in us and through us. Our desires then become the desires of God's heart, and he prompts us to carry out his kingdom work here on earth. I want you to pause with your house church now and pray for each other, that you and your house church would have the desires of God's heart, and that Christ would work in you and through you to carry out the work of the kingdom here on earth because of what Christ has done for you.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's that time again, time to, to talk with each other about what God has shown us throughout this week as we've talked, as we've spent time in his word. Um, so the way this works is I usually record Phil, and then I'll come in and share. And so you'll see that he talks about the exact same passage that I'm about to talk about. Um, it's not that I copied him, it's that God showed us the exact same thing, which is pretty cool. Um, and I'm sure in your house groups too, that, that happens occasionally where God shows you and another person the exact same thing. And uh, so yeah, so you'll, you'll see this come up later in the sermon. But anyway, what stood out to me is in Philippians 4, and I'll read verses 4 to 6, which says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So most of this, that section is really familiar to me, um, right? Like I've heard lots of times where it says like rejoice, all the time, always be rejoicing, or uh, um, when you're, let your, cast your anxieties upon him. Um, so like those things were really familiar to, me, to me as I read this, but the, the, the part that kind of jumped out at me that I'd never really noticed before was right at the end in verse seven, where it says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. And so like when I read that, I immediately thought of the verse in Proverbs, which says, guard your hearts for everything you do flows from that. And like, and there's a couple other verses that talk about like guarding your hearts from sin, 
But in this verse, it says that the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds. And like, that's not something that I really heard, or I guess maybe I've heard it before, I just never really actually recognized it. And so I read that, I was like, so God's peace will guard my heart. How do I get God's peace? And then like, you just look before and it says like, rejoice always and don't be anxious, but cast, but um, in everything by prayer, supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. So like rejoicing all the time and praying, and as we do that, God's peace comes over us and guards our hearts and minds. And so I was like, huh, well, that's pretty cool. And I, I think it, it's because that as we are rejoicing in God all the time and as we are not anxious or as we, as we are anxious that we pray and, and bring that all to the Lord, that we're so content, we're so at peace with him, that sin isn't all that appealing and our hearts are guarded from it because we're so content in the Lord. And so I thought that was a pretty cool way because usually when I think of guarding my heart, I just think of pushing sin out of my mind as quickly as possible. But it's not just that. It's, all, it's about rejoicing and prayer in God. And so I thought that was just what stood out to me this week. And so what about you? What stood out to you all this week? And maybe you'll have... Uh, the same as someone else. And, and another thing I wanted to, to add is if some of you either missed a whole bunch or, or weren't really very much in the word, talk about how you can help each other this week to remain. in. Good morning. Thanks for joining us here this morning. I have a couple of announcements before we get started. The first one is that our celebration service is coming up next Sunday at 4.30 and 7 p.m. We had a bit of a glitch on the website. It wasn't our fault, but nothing ever is our fault. Um, but anyway, it happened in behind the scenes. And, uh, and we, if you did sign up and you got an error message, just go back and sign up again. I know it's a pain and I'm sorry about that. I just don't know what else to do because I'm not a website guy. Uh, but, uh, but it has been corrected. So if you can go back and sign up for our celebration service, we would so love to have you there. It is such a great time of singing together and celebrating what the Lord is doing. Getting together is a big church. So please do come out. We really encourage that. It was a fantastic time last time. The singing was so loud that the sound guy said he had to turn the sound up because the 40 people that were here were overpowering the speakers. We would love if you would join us for that. The other thing is that on October 31st at 7 p.m., we are hosting a creation speaker here at the church. His name is Matt Bondi, and he is coming to give a biblical uh, defense of creation. So if you would like to come and see that, uh, we would love it if we could host you to do that as well. So please do uh, let us know and uh, we'll get an event put up on our website for that as well, just so we can do uh, what the government is asking us to do in making sure we know who's here and who's not and um, all, those, uh, all those things we're trying, to, we're trying to respect as the government uh, goes forward. Why don't we pray before we get started? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you that we can meet together in our homes to talk about your word and what it means to us. Lord, I pray that we would not hear this message and remain the same. I pray that you would impact us with the things that, uh, that you want to impact us with. I pray that our hearts would be moved by your Holy Spirit and that we would become more and more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In your name, amen. David Henry Thoreau was an American naturalist, essayist, poet, and philosopher. And he lived a long time ago. He lived in 1817 in Concord, Massachusetts, and he died only four ye 44 years later in the same place in Concord, Massachusetts. Thoreau was a pretty interesting man. He wrote some really interesting stuff about nature, about simple life, and about the government. He actually has a pile of quotes out there. But one of them is, one is not born into this world to do everything, but to do something. Pretty cool quote, actually. Seems like Thoreau thought that everyone has something that they're really good at, but not everyone is good at everything. He actually exemplified that, and he was focused on writing. And in those short 44 years that he had on the earth, he wrote so powerfully about the government and about how it should be run that he influenced people like Leo Tolstoy, Mahatma Gandhi, and Martin Luther King Jr. Like, 
worldwide influence in only 44 years. He did his something really well. This kind of focus is a good one to have when we think about our lives as believers who are part of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ body. Many of you who have been watching this video uh, over the last months know that we are studying as PABC through a series that is designed to help us return to be the church that pleases God. We want to do what God wants us to do. The theme of the year is return. And because we believe that God is using this COVID time and all of the hard things within this COVID time as a way to draw us back to himself, it means that we are trying to re-examine church and discover what it is that Jesus wants from his church as opposed to what we want from the church. And uh, sometimes those things are aligned and other times they're not aligned at all, right? We're seeing that through these challenges that are presented to us through this COVID season. And uh, and this morning, we're going to see what the church did in response to a problem that they faced um, that had to do with God's thing for the church. That's the title of the sermon is what's God's thing. And we're discovering that. And today we get to discover the heart of God for the community that the church is found in. So if you could turn to the book of Acts in your, in your Bibles, we're going to refresh ourselves about what God desires the church to be and take a closer look at what God's desires for the church are, uh, to, sorry, what the desires for the church are as their focus. So Acts chapter 6, 1 to 7, and I'll be reading in the NLT. And you can see that we've got the reference and uh, the version for you on the screen there. Hopefully that will help as, you know, sometimes we forget or lose our place or, or what version is that guy reading anyway? Those kind of things. So Acts 6, 1 to 7. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea, and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The numbers of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of, many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Okay, let's walk back through the passage and right back to the very first sentence. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, stop. (laughs) Commentators estimate that this particular chapter happens about five years into the life of the church. So between Acts 2 and Acts 6, there's likely five years there. And there's been five years of preaching, miracles, discipleship, and this amazing sharing of everything that they have with one another. It's incredible, right? So much is happening for these people. And now we've learned that it's happening over a long period of time. And they started with 3,000 And so likely the Lord has been adding to their number daily. Remember in the Bible, those who had been saved. So this could be a significantly large group of people by now. And perhaps maybe even more spread out than Jerusalem, but we don't know that yet. The disciples have been busy doing the thing that Jesus set out for them to do, which we find in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Go out into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So it's, it's very clear that message is priority one for these guys, and they are doing it. And they're teaching everything that Jesus commanded them, which we could sum up as love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The greatest commandment fit together with the Great Commission. Supernatural love for God and for people. And it's a growing movement, even though it's a costly one, right? So these people are giving up everything. They're giving up the way they used to live. They may be giving up family connections for people who said, you're wrong and you're out of the family. And they're actually giving up huge amounts of wealth and resource to share with others as they join the community of Christ. Even though this is a costly venture, 
People are jumping in all the time. But then a problem starts to emerge, which teaches us a whole bunch about the church and about God's heart for the community that the church is found within. And, and it all centers on these marginalized people who are physically poor. And we'll get to the problem that emerged in the church. But first, we need to take some time and study why is this so close to God's heart and therefore to the church's heart. And so I'd like you to do a small scriptural study in your house churches at home. We're going to put some passages up on the screen. Pause the video and read those passages aloud. I'd really encourage you to divvy up these passages through your house church and have everybody read a little bit of the word of God together. It's so good to do that and it will help you to see how important this particular issue is to God. So pause your video now. Mother Teresa once said that at the end of our lives, we will not be judged by how many diplomas we have received, how much money we have made, or how many great things we have done. We will be judged by, I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was naked and you clothed me. I was homeless and you took me in. As you have discovered, widows, orphans, and marginalized people matter to God deeply. All, the, all through the scriptures too, not just the Old Testament, but the New Testament as well. I saved one particular passage for me to speak on. So if you can take your Bible and turn to Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Matthew 25, 31 to 46. <clears throat> I'm going to turn there myself. Matthew 25. Okay, Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will sing to, say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? And when did we ever see you sick and in prison and come to visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it for me. Then the king will turn to those on his left and say, away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you did not feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you did not give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refused to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go to eternal life. Whew, that is a powerful passage. And we have to take it seriously because the church is the bride of Christ. And there really is no stronger passage in the word of God about this subject, right? The church is called to take up the cause of the widow, the orphan, the people in the margins, the criminals, the victims, the people who have issues, the people who are messed up, the people who can't get it together. This is actually a hard passage to read. First of all, it's scary. Heaven and hell are mentioned both in very definite ways and for very definite reasons, how we treated people of the least of these status on earth. It's scary because I think if there's a, there's a chance we're very honest with ourselves, we would have to admit that we don't really like doing these things that are mentioned there. No, I'm just shotgun generalizing everybody. It may be that you love doing this stuff. 
But I think if we looked, many of us looked inside, we would realize like, oh, I don't really want to do that. But this passage is so black and white clear that the early church would have been crazy to ignore it. And after all, it was Jesus himself that said this. Those are red letters in your Bible. And so therefore, we would be totally crazy to ignore this as well. If we want to be the church that pleases God, if we want to be the church that does what God wants us to do, then we need to do our utmost to do these things that Jesus said, right? If you're anything like me, as you read this, you were maybe even coming up with excuses or reasons why you didn't have to do those things at that one time when I had the chance. Or, or why it's, it's not really safe for us to do those things. Or why it's not really possible now. Or it's a totally different culture. And, and I agree, actually, that it is a totally different culture. Environment, a different country even, that we're living in. Things are done differently in the West than they were in the Middle East, where Jesus and the church are right now. But it does not get us out of things. It remains very, very clear to me and likely to you through this passage in Matthew 25 that Jesus holds the least of these in the highest regard. And they are here almost as a test for us to show the incredible love of God that we have to other people by caring for those who are the most needy and the most ignored by a great portion of our society. So now I have a question for you. And, and for those of you who usually walk through the message before answering questions, I'll ask you to maybe just interrupt your style of doing it just this once, because I'll probably end up partially answering it later. But how does this passage, and indeed this whole issue, apply today? We have all kinds of systems in place to care for the poor and the marginalized. Is it still our job to do this? Or can we rely on the systems that are in place to do what they're supposed to do? Why or why not? Personally, I think the answer to this question is kind of a both and rather than an either or, and I'll tell you why. Uh, first of all, because our country was originally founded on Christian principles. I think that many of the systems that we have here in Canada were put there with decent roots, if you know what I mean. The heart for others that is evident in the principles of these systems that are in place, it's very clear. Like Things like welfare, social assistance, housing, food banks, shelters for people with no homes. Like there, Those are all awesome things. And we need, to, we need to take people that we know to those places because they have resources and methods and systems for those people to succeed in that we just don't have. But you and I both know that those systems are abused fairly regularly. And we'll get to that issue in a few minutes. But what the system rarely has, at least from what I have seen, is that a person who loves the Lord Jesus is rarely the one who is administrating or administering the help. Our society has actually tried quite hard, especially in the last six or seven months, to remove the human element from our helping other humans. <clears throat> And yet when you look at what Jesus is saying and you're looking at the intimacy that these things are offered in, human contact is probably the point of this stuff, isn't it? Remember that it's the love that the church has for one another that proves the presence of Christ to the people who are watching. How are people supposed to see the hands and feet of Jesus in his followers if his followers aren't even here? And just saying, yeah, I'll help you from way over here. You got to be there, right? You need to be present in those moments. Look at those acts of intimacy. They're acts of a tender and compassionate heart who feels the call of God to give that love that they have within them to a person who desperately needs it. A person who desperately doesn't feel worthy of it, who may not even thank you for what you do, and that no one else wants to spend time with, the least of these. I feel convicted that we need to get out there and find those people. They can be harder to find in Saskatchewan, especially people who don't have a home, because we live in a cold climate. But there are many people who are very poor out there in many different ways, and you know what we're talking about here. We, we, we know people who are slaves to addictions. 
We know people who have been made victims by other evil people. We know people who are stuck in a way of life so unhealthy that it is breathtaking, but who literally have no idea how to live any other way. To make matters worse, because we live in a Christian society, many of the people who need Jesus the most have been inoculated against the gospel by people who, by, because they've heard it so many times from so many different angles and in so many different ways, they've just learned that, okay, I just got to listen to this, get it over with so I can get my food or I can get my, the, my needs met. And, and they're inoculated against the gospel because they've heard it so many times or maybe they've even had a believer who's hurt them. And it can be hard and discouraging work to work with people who are going through tough times or who have habits that put them in the margins and no desire to change. There's all kinds of thoughts that go through our minds when we try to help those people. And we think that oh, if you would just try a little harder, then this would be fine. Or if you would just, I don't know, you know what I mean, right? Even when we hand out food, clothes, money, shelter, visits, water, it doesn't seem to make a difference at times. And I realize how frustrating that is and that many people are so discouraged from even trying now. I tried that. It doesn't work. I'm not doing it again. Let me encourage you. Still try. The Lord didn't send us out to have amazing success and win thousands of people to Christ and gain glory for ourselves. He sent us out to obey his word and to try as hard as we can. And the Holy Spirit will supply the success. Just, we must get out there and work. <laughs> now I realized that this was like a massive seeming rabbit trail from the text that we were actually studying in Acts. But it's really not. It's just crucial for us to remember the heart that God has for the people of the community that the church is found in. We're actually really good at helping people who are really far away. We have massive amounts of money devoted to missions, and we should. And many of us have compassion or world vision children stuck up on our fridge, and we should. But we still need to put the human element into our help and our compassion for the community that we are immediately found in because that's where God's heart is too. Those broken and poor people that surround us here, he died for those people. And now here in Acts, there's a problem with that particular ministry. So let's get back into the Bible here. Grumbling has arisen in the church. <clears throat> and those, those apostles... Actually, the complaint that arises is that the apostles are treating certain widows of a certain ethnic heritage worse than a certain other group. Just think of how potentially damaging that problem was. Think if that problem came up today, how bad that would look. A potential accusation of something that sounds like racism or discrimination and not just of anyone in the church, the leaders at the center of the church. This, is, this honestly sounds like Satan trying to get into the church again, trying to mess things up. We've seen the enemy's fingerprints tarnishing the church, right? At the very beginning, people mocking the disciples for speaking in tongues. Right in the middle of everything, Ananias and Sapphira have their hearts filled up by Satan, and they lie and are struck dead in the church. And now we've got the, the enemy inciting grumbling against the leaders of the church for very righteous sounding reasons. So there's serious potential for trouble here. But then something awesome happens. The disciples handle the trouble immediately. So take a look at verse two. <laughs> oh man, do you realize I've been talking for like the last 25 minutes about one sentence of our passage. We are on pace for a 150 minute sermon today. I'm glad you're on your couch. Anyways, let's keep reading. <clears throat> there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek speaking believers complained about the Hebrew speaking believers saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 called a meeting of all the believers. All the believers. Like, wow, that is not a small deal. But neither are the problems in the church, right? The problems in the church are not a small deal. They have massive potential to cause harm to the body. It's almost like cancer. We've had a few people, members of our church, who have had cancer in the last couple of years. Do you know what happens when a person has cancer? It is like DEFCON 20. 
People are like, we're going to the hospital. You're getting treatment. This is happening. We're on pace. We're working hard. We are aggressively tackling that issue. That is exactly how the apostles go after problems in the church. We are aggressively going to tackle this issue. Everybody's in. Let's talk about it. And now, even though I know it's not the main point of the passage right now, I'd like you to take a few moments and discuss the disciples' strategy of tackling problems in the church. And if that would or wouldn't work today. And as you talk about that, maybe you could also discuss how should we tackle problems in the church? So, the disciples call this meeting and they basically tell the congregation of believers that they believe that this ministry of care for widows is extremely important, but it is not the priority that the Holy Spirit has given to them. They literally say that it wouldn't be right for them to look after this responsibility anymore. It can look like in your Bibles that they don't think it's important. Like it almost sounds flippant. We can't spend time working a food program. But the Greek actually says we can't do the ministry of the table uh, and do the ministry of the word. So they're saying that this is so important that we can't do two things at once. We need, to, we need an entire new level of leadership. They actually changed the way their church ran based on this need. And it's important for us to realize that this one thing concept that we talked about at the beginning of the sermon today applies right here. I don't know if it's only one thing God calls us to, but it's important to realize that in the body of Christ, God calls all people to do something in that body. And we all need to pitch in. And if we don't, the body suffers. We're going to get into that later in a different sermon this year. But that's what we're seeing here right now. The disciples are not going to do the ministry of the table because that's not their calling. They're evangelists who are trying their best to manage a huge program of food distribution when they really just want to pray and study the word. And that's what God told them to do. So it's breaking down. And rather than be mad and upset about the grumbling, they simply call everyone together and say, we're changing, we're doing this, let's do it. And everyone loved the idea. And that's awesome. It's, it shows the Holy Spirit is involved and it shows incredible wisdom. People who don't have certain gifts in certain areas are not going to succeed if you put them in that area. And it won't work well to put them into a place where they will not succeed. That's an issue for the church these days, which we will deal with in a few weeks. So anyways, the body comes together and they find seven men whose thing it was. And notice the condition of those leaders. They will be that they are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. The reason that wisdom is highlighted is, is that it's likely that all of these men display the fruits of the Spirit, but where wisdom is like a highlight in these men's lives. It's something that pops. Not only do they have a healthy walk with Christ, but they're just so good at doing things. They know what to do. They understand and they're able to act and act well. So these seven men take charge of a massive, could be over 5,000 people involved in this food program, as far as all the believers who are donating and receiving. And, and they take it and they, they begin to work at it. And we don't see how it went, but I'm sure it went well because they were full of the spirit. And, uh, and, and it gets me thinking about leaders. And so I want you to take some time and discuss in your small groups about the characteristics of leaders within the church. As we see the example here in Act 6, reflect on that and discuss what is the most important quality of a church leader. So now this passage ends by restating what's happening, which has been happening since the start of the church. Incredible growth and depth. Luke makes sure that we know the church is continually growing and continually flourishing and being blessed with growth numerically and in depth of relationship with one another and relationship with the Holy Spirit. The golden age of the church. I almost want to call it that. Like everything is great. And when there's a challenge, we handle it and we keep on going. The enemy attacks, but the, bo the body absorbs the attack and continues because they are faithful to the call of God 
and they are being the church. They are being the church that God desires. They're not in this for themselves. They're in this to love God and to love each other. And Luke ends with that. And I'd like to end, end on that note as well with a challenge to you. I'd love it if you as house churches would spend some time at the end of your time together, like after the video's off, talking about this. Right now, we don't have the ability to meet as we used to. And it doesn't look like that is going to change anytime soon. And so what does it mean to be the church for you as a house group? Our programs look different now. Our interactions look different now. It's easy to get fatigued and frustrated and discouraged. I actually called our district superintendent, Rob Cochran, this week, and we had a good chat about this because COVID is doing things to the church. It's doing things to everybody, but specifically to the church, it's causing discouragement, division, and distraction. We would say that COVID has done those things to the church. I might even say that the enemy is using COVID to do those things to the church, to cause discouragement where you're just tired of it. Everybody is there, right? Where it causes distraction. We're, we're not even talking about God as much anymore. We always talk about the virus. And I mean, how many of us are so tired of talking about the virus? And the other thing that it does is it, it causes division, Right? How, many, how many of us have heard a strong opinion this week or maybe a strong opinion in the last 10 minutes about COVID and about everything? It's causing division in the body and the world. It's causing discouragement and distraction. We need to fight against that. And because our fight is not against flesh and blood, it looks different, right? Our fight is an odd mix of spiritual and physical. We absolutely must be in continual deep prayer to the Holy Spirit about what to do with the time that we have now. And we need to be nurturing our, our relationship, our connection to Jesus. You know, I was reading in Philippians this past week in our Bible reading plan. I'm kind of taking this away from Joe, but I'm sure he already talked to you about it. Um, like, but the big thing that stood out to me was like, was just talking to Jesus about our problems. In Philippians, it says, don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. And the peace of Christ will guard your heart when you do that. That's a promise that God makes for you. Pray, always pray, pray always, never stop praying. That's our connection with the Lord. And the peace of Christ will guard your heart when you do that. And that's crucial for a spiritual soldier in the army of God. But it's not just about prayer. It's also about fighting physically, like with what we do in everyday life. We can make our house churches as healthy as possible. Not just careful of the virus healthy, but spiritually healthy as well. I can't see everybody physically now. It used to be that I could preach to everybody and we all say hi and shake hands and we all felt super good. But now you're only seeing like 10, maybe 12 people and my family can't even visit because we'll bump you over 15 now that our restrictions have changed. But what can you do in house churches to become as healthily, spiritually effective as possible? The Acts Church fought off a problem with prayer and action. Can we, can you do the same? Can we begin to do something as house churches? I challenge you to have a talk about this after the video is over. The Acts Church was growing because they were doing and being the church that God desired them to be. How can your house church be the church that God desires it to be? Are you evangelizing? Are you discipling? Are you making plans to evangelize and disciple and care for one another the same way that Christ loved and cared for us, his church? in the same way that we see right here in the book of Acts. The way soldiers of the Lord Jesus fight the enemy is by obeying the Lord Jesus himself. He has revealed his plan for victory right there in the scriptures. It's right there for us to learn. And we need to do these things, not just as individuals, but together. I mean, it is so tempting to just say, yeah, I had a great quiet time. Uh, me and the Lord are tracking really good. But that's actually not what God called us together to do, together. He called us, right? The, there is actually probably more effectiveness in doing these things together than there is separately. Our culture is so isolated and separated. It's almost like God through COVID has said, you know what? You want isolation? Fine, I'll give you isolation. And now we're isolated and we miss each other. Do things together. 
I believe that it is more important that we do things together these days than we do on our own. That's kind of countercultural, and that's encouraging because that's exactly what Jesus intended for us. We're going to pray and close now, but we're going to put the substance of these questions on the screen as you close today. Thank you for joining us. God bless you, and I'm so excited to see what he does in our house churches as a big Park Avenue Bible Church network. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the work that you have done in our church. Lord, we have been separated by the, by the restrictions that we are trying to respect. But Lord, you have not been absent from our midst. You're together with us right now. We can meet in little groups and we can be just as effective for you because you are the reason we're getting together. Lord Jesus, please help us to be as effective as we can in Melfort and in the surrounding areas. Help us to be the church that you want us to be, to return to the way you want us to be. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.